can uh, I want to take this out from the image uh, here. I honestly do think that you can just remove it, but we can try to. Yeah, I like to do things. Yeah, yeah, that's better. All right, yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, ah. it's currently in use. Uh, no, it isn't. We've got the microphone and, and that too. Ah, uh, uh, you are the, the new chair, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, cool. So I Uh, can I have your attention? We're ready to start the next talk. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Waiter Rodel. Uh, Extremal combinatorics and uh, Ramsey theory were among one of the most favorite uh, topics of Paul Erdős, and Waiter made a profound contribution to both of these areas. Uh, over the years, Waiter found solutions of many hard and long-standing long problems of Paul Erdős, probably more than anybody else in combinatorics. And today, I'm sure we will see the solution of several more of Erdős's conjectures. Please wait. So, first of, isn't it too loud? So, first of all, thank you very much for a uh, nice introduction and uh, also for the invitation. I am very glad to be here to celebrate Paul Erdős 100th birthday. I owe him a lot. Uh, he had a great impact on my life. 
and uh, influenced my mathematical interest very much. Uh, <coughs> I have to get used to it. Okay. Uh, the first time I met him was 40 years ago, precisely 40 years ago, when there was a conference in Cas Day, or I, actually I saw him only in, the, in that occasion. But uh, um, in some sense, I feel uh, urged to tell you something now, some memory which I kept for myself for a long time, and you will see that it was for a good reason. Uh, 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 my little bit later than this 40 years, some, some 39 years ago, 38 years ago, uh, we were invited with Jarek to give a lecture in Budapest, and uh, uh, we came after a long overnight uh, train ride, and the lecture happened one day earlier than I expected, and it was maybe my first lecture uh, ever, so enough of excuses. It was very bad lecture. It was not clear at all. I was not prepared. And after the lecture, Paul Erdes took me aside and uh, told it to me. He told me perhaps this was the first lecture I heard recently. But then he was too nice to leave it like that. So he saw it a little bit and said, well, maybe I saw a verse lecture recently. <laughs> and in the end, he smiled and told me, but yours was the second verse. <laughs> so. After that, uh, let me start with my memory or with my talk with the, uh, my first encounter with Professor Erdes. It was precisely 40 years ago, and uh, he had this birthday party in Cast Hay, and at that time I was just finishing my master's degree in Prague. And actually I was not even sure if I want to continue with mathematics, we had some too abstract mathematics, and I was kind of not maybe at that time ready for it. And uh, so I was glad to finish. And, and, but, but Jarek Neshetřil, who was an assistant in those, uh, at that time, young assistant, told me, come with me and, uh, and uh, to see the famous professor. So we went there. And uh, so we went there, and I will show you the picture of Kerstay. This is it. It was at the Hotel Helicon. I stayed somewhere in the camp. And uh, during the conference, we learned about the question of Fred Galvin and related conjecture of Erdes, Professor Paul Erdes and uh, uh, Professor Andras Heinel. And with a stroke of luck, we were able to solve a special case of Galvin's question. And a little bit later, a couple of months, we solved the whole problem. Uh, the following year, there was a conference in Prague. And uh, Paul Erdes came a couple of days earlier to have a look at us. And uh, actually, since then, he was coming every year, or he was inviting us to come to Budapest. And later, when I moved to Atlanta, he was visiting every year in Atlanta as well. So, uh, yeah, maybe I show you the picture from that time. So this is from Prague with Jarek and his son. And this is how we worked. So each time when we met, he asked us questions. What he, you know, he asked us what we have been doing. And then he thought about it and invented for us a new set of problems that guided us for the next year what to do. And uh, this way he led me from one problem to another and really influenced my mathematics and got me into it. During our time together, I was not only lucky to learn from an exceptional mathematician, but I was also fortunate enough to spend time with a kind and generous gentleman. 
uh, it will change my life. So sorry about it. So and that's what we have here. Okay, right. Uh, in 1995, uh, not long, yeah, so, yeah, so maybe that's these pictures we showed, and he also was sending me problems, and uh, uh, as Noga said, he wrote the letters like this, and, uh, and also gave me his book. You see that I used it also a lot, and uh, I read almost every paper in it. So Polar Dash received many uh, honorary degrees, but maybe the last one he did receive was uh, the one at Emory in 1995. Maybe, I don't know. So if not the last, then one of the last ones. Here is he is receiving the degree. And uh, here he is uh, with my colleague Ron Gould and famous baseball player, and Karen. However, in the picture, from the picture, it seems that who was called a home run king, as I understood, but it seems that rather Hank Karen is uh, amazed from the company he found himself in. So Paul Erdes was uh, very much, uh, yeah. So yeah, before I finish, uh, start, so, so maybe I should finish this and uh, start with some mathematics. Yeah, so. So I will start to talk about uh, Erdes Galvin Heinel question, which uh, led to my first encounter, encounter with, uh, with Paul Erdes. And this is a Ramsey type question. So I will start with the Ramsey theorem. So <coughs> Ramsey theorem states that for all integers p and r, there exists an integer n such that every r coloring of the edges of the complete graph yields a monochromatic copy of kt. We will use a lot of the following notation. We will uh, talk about graphs and uh, for integers r and a, if r and the graph and h and g, we will use so-called arrow notation, which was used by Erdes, uh, Rado, and Heinal. H arrows g to mean that if every coloring, r coloring of the edges of h yields a monochromatic copy of g. So for r equal to two, this is the case I will talk a lot, we will omit the r subscript and write simply h arrows g. So for example, k6 arrows, arrows k3 or k17 arrows k3 for three colors, meaning that every three coloring of k17 yields a monochromatic k3. Uh, also I will talk about click numbers a lot. So for a graph g, the click number omega g is the order of the largest complete subgraph of g. So the question of Erdes and Heinel uh, was the following. For every integer t, does there exist a graph h such that h arrows kt and omega h is t? So in other words, Ramsey theorem says that if I take a large clique, then I get a monochromatic kt. But of what about if I will consider only graphs which don't have large clique and have as small as clique as possible. And of course, there must be a clique of size c if I want it monochromatic in the end. So there can't be smaller clique. But does there exist a graph which has the clique of that size only? And this is the question I will talk about the first half of the lecture. So this is, uh, so Folkman answered this question positively. Uh, he showed that indeed this is true, but surprisingly his proof only worked for two colors. And 
somehow it was not possible to adapt it for more colors. And uh, so he asked uh, whether one can have uh, the same theorem with more colors. So the related question I we heard in Caste, and it was a question of Galvin, who asked whether for every graph G there exists a graph H with the property that any two coloring, say, of the edges of H will yield a monochromatic copy of G, and moreover, clique numbers are preserved. So one can observe, and we will, uh, that uh, truth to Galvin's question gives a truth to Folkman's question. So let's see the difference. The, uh, the Galvin is that we want to have an arbitrary graph G rather than just the clique, but we don't care about number of colors. We are happy with two. And here is the reason why it follows, it's very trivial, but I, so suppose that we know uh, Folkman, or we know Galvin, sorry, so we, we can have for KT, we can have a Ramsey graph F for two colors, and for graph F we can have a Ramsey graph H, and always the clique numbers are preserved, but then easy claim says that if I four color edges of H, uh, then I get a monochromatic number of, uh, then I get a monochromatic copy of KT, and the clique numbers are preserved. And to see it is just that imagine H, and it's colored by four colors, and suppose that somebody who is colorblinded and doesn't distinguish red from blue or green from orange, and green from orange looks at it, and then he will see a monochromatic copy of F by the first arrow, H arrow set. So either it will be like this or like that. It's, F will be contained in, say, green or orange. But then the second arrow will tell us that there is a monochromatic copy of KT. So this is really obvious. So uh, that was the Galvin's question. That was the motivation. And uh, that was the theorem that we proved with Yarick. 73, a special case for triangle free graphs, and in fact, in, at the conference and a little later in fall for arbitrary clicks. So, special case appears in the conference. And of course, if we know it for two colors, we know it for R colors by this uh, obvious uh, or easy, easy uh, implication. So in the next part of the talk, I will speak about numeric aspects of this question. So we fix integers r and s and a graph g uh, with a clique number less than s. And we will look on the following function. f r g s will be the minimum size of the Ramsey graph H for R colors that has the clique number smaller than S. So we are coloring edges of H by R colors. Uh, the clique number of H is smaller than S, and we would like to get G monochromatic. And we want to minimize size of H. So by the corollary, by the previous theorem, the function is well-defined, so we can have it, uh, always such a graph, so it's less than infinity. And uh, actually, first time it was asked by Paul Erdesh, what is the first instance of this problem? So maybe I will just mention a little bit here it from his paper. <coughs> so, uh, so the number he used, not K3, but just 3 in his text. So he said that he pointed out that F236 is 8. So that means that if we forbid K6, K, K6, of course, arrows uh, triangle. But if we forbid K6, 
then the minimum graph is the property that is a rose triangle has eight vertices. And this was proved by Ron Graham. And at that time, Irving showed that F235 is less than 18. Now it's known that it's equal to 14. But F234 was the tough one. At those times, it was this big. And uh, Paul Erdes offered the maximum of $100 and 300 francs for a proof or disproof that it's less than 10 to the 10. Uh, there is maybe interesting thing that it was not clear in those days whether $100 is more than three, 300 francs. But uh, the other thing is that uh, there was, this was a popular sport, and there is a number of papers about it eventually, or so uh, uh, it was followed by paper of Frankl and me, and then Joel Spencer, who collected 100 francs dollars and then another hundred dollars were, were, was collected by Lincoln Blue for 10,000 pounds and then we got this Dudek less than 1,000 and eventually it's now 800 by Radishevsky. Anyway, so, but maybe it's less than 100 but certainly it will need some idea to get F234 less than 100. So already 1,000 was, it, it, there was some trick in so this is the thing, and then one can ask about the general bound, right? So what is F2 kT t plus 1? So let me repeat what it means. What is the size of the minimum size of the graph H, which will not have clique of size t plus 1, but if we two color its edges by red and blue, we will get kT monochromatic. So uh, this is, uh, so if we put, so this F2 kT t plus 1 is the one which we are interested in. If I put here infinity, I, I mean I don't put any restriction. So in other words, I'm talking about the Ramsey number. So it, it is at least exponential. And uh, uh, we had some proof about random Ramsey uh, when we studied the uh, properties of Ramsey graphs, uh, random graphs, Ramsey properties of random graphs. And when we analyze these proofs, it gave us a double exponential bound. And it, it was done independently by Conlon and Gower and uh, Ruchinsky, Schacht, and me. And uh, for a while, we believed that this might, or because it was done independently, two different proofs, and we were quite happy with it. But very recently, we observe or show it, it requires a proof which is based on the uh, result of Balog, uh, Morris, and Samoti, which is a new exciting result, and it uses the idea of Steger. One can prove such a bound which is only exponential, but in the exponent we have still t to the 6. And perhaps the result of Saxon and Thomason would give similar bound. Possibly with similar numerical bounds. So the, I, the proof is kind of technical, and I will not attempt to show it here. But I have to show, no, I don't have to show anything. But I will show something very obviously. If we have some, some something, so what we do? We use G and P. We set P uh, equal to this. So we have to, of course, plug in concrete numbers, and it's depending exponential six two to the t to the six, but I, I keep it equal to n. And due to this fact that it equals to this, one can observe that n squared p is a lot less than n to the t p to the t choose two and lot bigger than n to the t plus one. Whatever you see, it is bigger than, right? So I, I would write my own. And now this green potato is a space of all graphs. G and P, and if we uh, look on those graphs which don't contain KT plus one, and on those graphs which don't arrow KT, both these events are very unlikely for the random graph, but yet the blue event is much bigger than the red event. And what it means that we get a graph which doesn't contain KT plus one, and yet is Ramsey. So that's a very high uh, kind of level uh, proof. But so 
or the mo most most tricky or the, uh, the difficult part is that that's so how to show this or detect the volume. Okay. So maybe a few words about this Folkman function. So uh, so we could ask what is this? We could ask what is this number? Uh, so once more, if S was equal to T plus 1, if we forbid the clique T plus 1, we saw that we could show 2 to the T to the 6. If we are a little bit uh, less harsh and allow bigger clique, actually of type HT, then we can get the bound linear. This is, in fact, very easy to show. Or, yeah, I won't show it here, but it's, it's this. And uh, so it might be that it's exponential, even if we forbid the tab one. But of course, that's a, that's a guess. All these things are very, very new this spring, and I don't have much uh, feeling for them. Kind of whether whether it's linear or not in exponential, whether this is true. But it to prove or disprove it might be a good question. So of course, one could ask, uh, in view of this Galvin theorem, or, or the Galvin question and, and our, our theorem, one could ask the same thing for a general graph, G. And kind of it would look on the first, uh, uh, from the first look, that if, you, if we know it for cliques, then we should know it for every graph. But that's not true. Uh, so this, this question above is this. So we would like to find H minimizing the size of H and satisfying that H is Ramsey to G and preserves the clique number. So this is what the question means. And what I wanted to say is that for this function, we, we know a lot less. Uh, it appears to be difficult to use the random construction uh, obtaining H from G and T for graph G which contain, which contain some dense subgraphs or which are for simplicity dense themselves. Uh, so for example, if we will talk about triangle free graphs, then uh, I don't see a way, of course, I don't see many things but there is no natural, or somebody would have to be, uh, invent some new trick to, to use GNT. But maybe some other model, but then it would be interesting. So if we would have a graph which has twice as many uh, edges than vertices, then it seems to be hard. And here is the reason why. So suppose I want to have a Ramsey graph for or G, which has V vertices, E edges, click number T, and I would like to obtain the Ramsey graph from G and P. So, so that graph should arrow G and should contain clicks of size T only, maximum, the largest click is of the size T, not T plus one. And because it doesn't, it shouldn't contain any click of size T plus one, from our point, yeah, it seems that the number of cliques of size T plus one should be a lot less than the number of edges. So we should have this relation. On the other hand, because it should be Ramsey, uh, the copies of G should sit on, several copies of G should sit on every edge, otherwise these edges won't be useful at all. So we should have that relation, and if we compare them we got this upper bound for the density. So it turns out that random graphs most likely won't help us. So the question is how to do it, whether, so if you use the theorem, we have several proofs of this theorem with CRX, but all of them are not efficient. And, uh, and, uh, and in general, of course, there was no attempt to minimize it. It, it all, all occurred to me only when preparing this talk. Uh, the best gives a tower of height 
V squared log V, where V is the number of vertices of the graph G. So it's pretty, it can't be true, right? So this can't be right bound. So it should be exponential, double exponential, something like that. So maybe it's not a bad problem because it calls for some new model, which would be good, or, or some efficient construction. But uh, the, yeah, it's tough to come up with that efficient construction, usually. Yes. Oh, it does, yeah, R colors, two colors, it's kind of, pardon me? Conclusion, for every, there is such that H arose G and omega is, I am sorry, oh, right, you are right, right, yes, thank you very much, right, I should, yeah, so the sentence starts different way than it ends. Right, thank you very much, right. So, so let's, <laughs> I didn't write it. For every uh, integer r, for example, for r equal to two, right? So, right, so, right, yeah, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mikhail. Anyway, so uh, this is all about this topic, and since I have time, I will talk about the other topic, but uh, so I wanted to have some brief intermission. This is Peter Frankl couldn't make it to come here. So he sent me at least this photo uh, and for people, because the second problem is kind of similar but different. So for those who took a nap, it will just uh, mean that I am ta talking now about something different. So this is in 1986 in Japan with Zolifi ready. So, the other problem is also dealing with this clique numbers. And, uh, and uh, so for a graph H and a set W, the set W is T independent if it doesn't have a clique of size T, right? So set W is T independent if it doesn't have a set of size T. So, T independence number for the graph is the largest, is the size of the largest T independent subset. So we want in a graph H to find a subgraph which will not have a KT. So in particular, when T is equal to two, this is the independence number because we don't want to see there any edge. So perhaps the motivation is as follows for what, what I will talk about, the Ramsey problem, <coughs> or oh, actually I'm not, I don't, Ramsey number problem is that we are, we are asking in Ramsey context how big must n be so that every graph on n vertices as either clique of si bigger than T or independent set of size bigger than L. And uh, the following question was asked by Professor Heinal, as uh, yeah, I read in the paper of Erdes and Rogers, how big N must be so that every graph on N vertices will have either clique of bigger than T or T independent set bigger than L. So the questions are very similar, only the second is more general. Uh, it's, it's not, but somehow the original paper of Erdash and Rogers deals with this case. I will talk about this case, but I will mention that there, are, there is a lot known about general case, so I just didn't want to write it. So it is, it is, it is stated as, as for, that way in the, in the, yeah, I don't know. To me, it's not important. Uh, so, but somehow, right, so to, to, to explain what uh, we talked with Ehud, so I, to have less parameters, I will just uh, 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 um, uh, consider the following function, HTN, which will be minimum of alpha t h, where the minimum runs over all graphs with n vertices, 
and the largest uh, clique number less than C. So the function is asking for the largest peak dependence, that which we can guarantee in KT plus one free graphs on n vertices. So and, and the question of uh, Heinel was what bounds can be established for this function. And because this function is a little tricky, at least to me, with minimum over maximum, because in a graph I try to find the maximum independent set, I will just say what follows from the definition. If we should show that uh, uh, the, a, the function is bigger than L, then it means that we should show that for every graph on N vertices, which doesn't contain KT plus one, there exists a set on L vertices, which is the lower bound, L, which we should show, which is P independent, which doesn't contain KT. So this is what it means to show the lower bound. And uh, for the problem which I uh, stated for this HDN, the easy lower bound is root N. And in order to see it, we can, so what we should show once more that no matter which graph you give me, kt plus one free, I will find a set of size root n, which doesn't contain kt. So given a graph h on n vertices, which is kt plus one free, uh, we should find the set of this size, which is kt free, and we will find it distinguishing two cases, either there exists a vertex with the large neighborhood bigger than root n, but then we are immediately at home because uh, the graph didn't contain kt plus one, so the neighborhood will not contain kt, or every, or, or every degree, every, uh, the maximum independence or every vertex has neighborhood less than root n, but then of course we find even independent set of size root n. So um, this is a very easy bound. On the other hand, if we should show about the upper bound, so what it means, we should show that there exists a KT plus one graph, which uh, has the following property, that for every W, for every subset of size U, that set will contain KT. So this is what it means to show the, the, the upper bound. And this is, uh, this is really trivial upper bound, but again, to get into the mindset uh, uh, what it means to show it, let me show that this is true. And uh, to show it, we can consider n, over, n divided by t disjoint cliques of size t. Of course, this is t plus one free, kt plus one free, but if you give me a set which has this many elements, uh, one of the, yeah, uh, that set must take one of the, one of the cliques, right? And therefore, we uh, fulfilled our mission, right? So this is what we were supposed to show. The first non-trivial result about this function was obtained by Erdes and Rogers, who showed a, uh, bound which is uh, n to the one minus epsilon t. And uh, pr they constructed, they used the graphs defined on the sphere and uh, two vertices are connected if the distance is uh, larger than certain number so that we don't have these uh, si simplices of size t plus one cliques. As, uh, so, and this way they got this bound. Let me mention that uh, for, if we would consider t equal to two, the following is uh, known, so, uh, or it's, uh, we have the bound that it's, the function is asymptotically equal to root n log n, and this follows from, this is just a reformulation of Aitai, Komlo, Semered, and Kim result that says that every triangle free graph contains an independent set, because two independent means independent 
optimize root and log n, and this is the best possible. So therefore, we have the equality. Uh, for t bigger or equal than 3, uh, I will talk about a little bit about this, uh, this upper bound from coming from this result. So the lower bound was coming from the results of Bolobash and Hint, Krivelevich, and Dudek and Mubai have some uh, recent uh, improvement based on the, uh, on the shearer. So, and as far as I, and the upper bound was studied successively by Erdes, Rogers, Bolobash, and Krivelevich. I have a paper with Dudek and then Wolfowitz uh, improved it in case t equal to three. Uh, he modified our contraction, but in a very smart way. And actually, then we studied his contraction and, and analyzed it a little bit more in detail and, and, and could extend it for every t. So this is the, actually, yeah, 2012, maybe this one. Uh, so in other words, we, this is a construction of a graph that doesn't, that doesn't contain kt plus 1, yet if I take every subset, arbitrary subset of root n times log n to the 40 squared vertices, then I find a copy of kt. <coughs> so uh, I will soon finish, but I think still I have a couple of minutes. So the, uh, the proof is in uh, uh, using different model than GNT, it's uh, uh, obtained as follows. So we take a affine plane of order Q, where n is equal to Q squared. And, uh, and then this plane would have Q squared plus Q lines, but we just take some of them. We take them with probability log squared n over root n. So n is Q squared, but some of, from now on I will talk about in terms of n, I take a different. So this way, every vertex will have the degree about log squared n. And, uh, and uh, so, so I have such a affine plane, which is trimmed, but no graph yet. And uh, next, in the second step, uh, imagine this is a line, this potato, and in this line, we insert a complete t partite graph. But we insert it randomly. So we fix the first, first uh, uh, object, maybe list some of its properties, and now we do the second random choice that we add the uh, random KTTT, uh, no, so the co complete partite graph three times. So this way we get a graph which will contain only few copies of kt plus 1. They cannot be in the lines. They can, because in the line I have just maximum kt, so they must be shared by various lines. But there is not a big degree in this, uh, in this uh, uh, affine plane which we trimmed. So, so there are only few copies in every edge. But uh, we would like to, ha to have the graph to be kt plus 1 free, so we are not yet done. And on the other hand, every large set contains many edge disjoint copies of kt. Large means what is meant large for us, what we wanted to talk about. And many means this. It's not so important, but it is important that we just want one. So in the first, we want a little bit more. And in the second property, we want a little bit less. We have many, and we want it just one. So we take a random subgraph of this graph with a certain probability, apply the Lovas local lemma, and show that there exists a graph with the required properties. Um, the general uh, Erdes Rogers function, it was studied in more general context, instead of having maximum freaks just t plus 1, uh, um, um, 
we can consider it this uh, uh, maximum fleet plus or equal to S. And, uh, and uh, for T uh, smaller or equal than S. And there are results in this, uh, uh, for this, this uh, more general function by Bolobaj and Krivelevich and Sudakov. Uh, because the, this function is closely related to Ramsey function, uh, the bounds are not lower and upper bounds don't meet. They, as far as I yeah, uh, know, the, they meet only for the case I discussed, and uh, which corresponds to R3, T, the uh, number which is we also know. And, uh, and uh, I will not talk about this, how it defends this Ramsey number. So I could maybe state some problems in the end, but on the other hand, maybe it's time to finish, and I will finish. I think everybody wants to go to lunch, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Vojta, for a nice talk. Uh, questions? Uh, so if not, I want to thank Vojta and all the speakers of the morning again, and we'll meet in the afternoon. Right. Yeah. Oh. Mm. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.